Christ. Heavenly Father, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our wills and bend them to your own. And above all else, Lord Jesus, set our hearts on fire with a love for you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, go ahead and uh, have a seat, uh, if you will. Have a seat uh, on this exciting day that is, uh, that is, that is Baptism Sunday. Uh, it's also our first baptisms ever here at, uh, at Redeemer, which makes it extra special and extra exciting for us uh, also. What I'd like to do is to spend a couple of minutes here explaining what is, what is going on at baptism. What's, what's happening? What are we a part of today? Um, because this is not a new thing. W- what, is, what is going to happen here in our midst and that we are a part of? And Wow, that's toasty warm. That, I'm getting in there. Um, that, um, uh, what's what's going to happen in our midst today uh, has been something uh, that, is, that has happened for thousands of years uh, at the command of God. Uh, And so we are taking part in something this morning that is much bigger than ourselves, Um, uh, that 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 transcends our little church planting effort here and our families and our relationships. This is something that God has been doing for a long, long time. There's something amazing that is happening in our midst. And so I'd like to give a little background as to why, why, what's going on with this. Uh, but, but I have to say this to begin with. Um, uh, some of you are visiting from other places. Some of you uh, may be churchgoers. Some of you maybe not. Some of you are from other denominations or traditions. There's sometimes there's controversy that surrounds baptism. Okay. And it usually centers around two things. One, how much water do you have to use? Right? Do you have to dunk them all the way under, or can you sprinkle it on their heads? Right? There's, so there's, there's debate about that as to, whether, as, to, as to whether one is acceptable or one is not. Right? But then also, um, how old do you have to be to be able to get it done? Right? Can, you, can you baptize babies? Do you have to be an adult? Do you have to, what, what, is, what is the correct age for that? I just want to set those things aside for a second. We'll get back to that, but I want to set those things aside for a second and dive into the scripture to find out what is the basis of what baptism is. And it's not the New Testament where, where we get the Jesus's commands for, for baptism. It actually begins in the Old Testament. If you have your Bibles with you, you can turn with me. There should be one, a Bible around you if you don't have yours with you as well, um, or you don't have to turn, you can listen as well, uh, to Genesis chapter 17. That's the first book of the Bible. Uh, it's right after the book of Table of Contents. Um, Come on, come on now. We, <laughs> he, he, he. All, right, all right, so here we go. Uh, Genesis 17 is where we are. Uh, Genesis 17. So what we're, where we're picking up the story here, kind of in the middle, what's already happened is creation. God's created the earth. He's created Adam and Eve, and he created them in a garden, and he created them in relationship with one another and with himself. Uh, and, then, uh, and then things go kind of badly because he says, listen, you can have any tree, in the, uh, the fruit of any of the trees in the garden to eat. You can do anything that you please in here. There's really just one rule. Don't eat from this one tree. Okay, um, and that tree was not a magical tree. Uh, it was not a Snow White apple kind of tree, right? It wasn't when they. If you if you have any background in church, you know the story here. Adam and Eve. They're not supposed to eat from the one tree, but they do eat from that one tree. Um, and uh, and it's what we call the fall of man. It, it wasn't because that fruit was poisonous or because it was cursed somehow. The point was simply that God told them not to. But that they decided in their hearts that they knew what was best, that they knew better than God um, what would bring pleasure and uh, and fulfillment and joy and happiness and success in life, that they knew and that God didn't. Because God told them not to, and they went, he doesn't know what he's talking about. We're going to do this anyway. That's, That's the real issue that happened with Adam and Eve eating the fruit off of that tree. It's not the fruit itself. It's... It's, it's the people, it's their, it's their heart, it's the rebellion that took place when they said, we are going to position our lives in such a way where we're at the head of it. We know what's best. God is not, is not the one who we can trust in this. That's what we call sin. Okay? It's, it's an easy way to look at what sin is, our, our rebellion against God. And so sometimes now, sin sometimes is our actions, the things that we do. Sometimes it's the things that we, uh, that we should have done that we didn't do. So sins of commission or sins of omission, right? Things we did do but shouldn't have, things that we should have but didn't do. Commission and omission. Um, but then also uh, we have what we call a sin nature because, because what happened when Adam and Eve rebelled against God is that something got screwy in our DNA, 
I mean, in our spiritual DNA, there's something that got twisted in us. And so we have a natural bent away from the things of God. Um, in the example that I always, always use, and I try to explain this, is if you don't believe me that you were born with a natural bent away from the things of God, peace, love, harmony, happiness, all of these kind of things, um, I, I just want you to take two two-year-olds and put them in a room together with one toy. Let me tell you what doesn't happen, okay? What doesn't happen when you take the two two two-year-olds and you put them together with this one little truck in the middle of the floor, uh, they do not look at each other and go, dear friend, although I long to play with this toy, your joy and happiness comes before mine, and so therefore, I would encourage you, no, I must insist, in fact, that you play with the toy, and I will be here to watch, and my enjoyment will come from you playing with the toy. That... That is not what happens when any two two-year-olds come in the same place. I mean, you put them on the floor, and it's like it's, it's, it's high noon, right? And, they've, and, they're, and they're going, bing, bing, bing. I mean, there's about to be a shootout over, over the, the toy that's in the middle because they go, mine. One, is it, one says, it's mine. The other says, it's mine. And they will fight over it, and they will scream and yell. Right? Am I, are you with me? Who taught them that? Who taught him that? Did, did, when, when, when you were in the hospital uh, and you had the baby and it, was, and it was taken away from you for a little while and you don't know what happens in that warm little incubator room, do you think that the nurse was in there going, listen, you need to be selfish, okay? What you need to do, you get everything is yours. You make sure that nobody gets anything that you don't have. Listen to me, right? What you, you, that truck is yours. Nobody taught them that. They were just born. They popped out knowing how to be bent away from the things of God. And you spend the rest of your life as parents trying to correct that. But the problem is your heart's screwed up too. Right? We have a sinful nature that is inside of us. A natural bent away from the things of God. So, so that's what happened at the very beginnings of the, the story of, of, uh, of human life and God's relationship with us. That's Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Okay, so God doesn't leave us in this state, though, where we have eaten from the fruit, uh, we've rebelled against Him, we've been thrown out of the garden, our relationship with Him is broken, our relationship with one another is broken. He doesn't just leave us in that, because our God is a God who loves us and is compassionate upon us, even when we are in our sin, and even when we are in rebellion against Him, and we do things that hurt others and ourselves and Him. He still loves us deeply and passionately and longs for us to know him and his glory and his, and his goodness. And so chapter 1, 2, and 3 of Genesis, that's mm, this much of the Bible. 1 and 2 of Genesis, that's when it all was going well. The rest of this is about God bringing his people back to himself. The rest of the story of Scripture is about God saying, you're wrong that my ways aren't best. When you live your life your way, you will get into a mess. I didn't design the world to have war in it. Where did war come from? Because you decided to go and do things on your own in your way. I didn't design the world to have sickness in it. Where do you think that came from? You decided you knew what was best. And we could could go on. The rest of the story is about God saying, repent and come back, and I'm going to provide a way for that to happen. So if you're, if you're in Genesis chapter 17, there's a major moment here. We're skipping over a lot of stuff because we don't have until uh, dinner time tonight. So, we, um, uh, so we're skipping over a lot of stuff. But in Genesis chapter 17, something, something amazing happens. God has, uh, has appeared to this guy named Abram. Later on, he's going to be called Abraham, okay? They're both the same guy. Um, And when he was 99 years old, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. So God said, I'm going to make a covenant. This is an important point for what we're talking about today. A covenant. A covenant is an agreement between two different people, kind of like a contract in a way, where one party says, I'm going to do this, and then the other party says, I'm going to do that. Okay, it's a binding covenant that we have made, a promise that, that we have made together. Now, God's covenant 
says, I'm going to make my covenant between me and you and multiply you greatly. First of all, you have to recognize, God says, here's the agreement. I'm going to bless you. Right? I mean, most of the time when there's an agreement, it's, I'm going to bless you and therefore you will, you'll do your part. Right? Well, we'll get to that in a second. But it begins with God's initiative. God is the one who's pursuing us before we're ever pursuing God. Okay, um, And he says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to multiply you greatly. In other words, God is making a people that we're going to call the covenant people, the people with whom he's made his agreement. Later on, the way that this covenant is summarized is easy. It's this. Our covenant is, I will be your God, you will be my people. That's the way it's said over and over and over and over again in the Scripture. I will be your God, and you will be my people. This is a big deal, remember, because Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, we were with him and in relationship with him. Genesis chapter 3, we walked away from that. And God doesn't cross his arms in anger and turn away from us and squash us. But he says, listen, I'm going to make a deal with you. I will be your God, and you will be my people. He offers us relationship. He offers us connection with him. He offers to not leave us, even though we have tried to push him away. And so he's through this guy, Abram, uh, Abraham, God is making a people. All right, so verse 4. Uh, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. And I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you, the land of your wanderings or sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Okay? So what he just said was there's a, there's a promised land. Now, you've heard that phrase before. All that means is that it's a land that was promised to you. God promised you're going to have this land. All right? But more importantly than the land, what we're looking at today is the idea of God's blessing and God's covenant and God making a covenant people that if you're in, if you're a part of that covenant people, you have God's blessing and God's blessing means I will be your God and you will be my people. So what happens after this is he says, there's going to be a physical mark that to recognize the people who are a part of this covenant. If you're in the people of God, there's a physical mark that is going, that you are going to perform so that people will know. The Old Testament, it's called circumcision, okay? If you read down a little bit farther, this is all the stuff that that, uh, I made Nancy read this morning, and she did it without blushing too, which was good, Um, that uh, um, that, verse 10, this is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you, every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised, every male. And he goes on, right? So, so Abraham's like, all right, God, God, he's going to be my God. We're going to be his people. He's going to make me fruitful. I'm going to be, a, I'm going to be the father of many nations. And the mark of that is going to be, huh? Right? Like he went, he went, he went, he was like, he said, God, I'm, I'm tracking with you i got to do what? Right now, why would God have a physical mark of circumcision? Okay, The covenant God made with Abraham, he said, I'm going to make with you and your offspring. So God said, the way that you're going to be a part of this covenant people is by being born into it. And so, let, let's put this delicately. We will mark the thing that is used to make more people. You with me? If not, ask your neighbor. All right. Um, um, that, so, so the idea here is this is generation after generation. This is passed down. And so there's a physical mark to show we are part of the people of God. We trace our lineage back to Abraham. And this physical mark, circumcision, lets people know that we are a part of that, of that lineage. Now, here, here's the problem. Um, you have this community of God. Okay. 
And then and God says, okay, I'll be your God, you will be my people. Let me teach you how you will be my people. And so this is where we get the law of the Old Testament, the, the dietary restrictions. You don't eat pork, you don't eat shellfish, those kind of things, right? Um, the, uh, the, the things that they wore, there's restrictions on that. How they dress, there's things, there's things about that. How they behave, how, what, what the punishment for certain things are. All of the Old Testament law, God is saying this. Okay, remember the context. You said you know best, not me. And so I'm going to teach you, okay? If you want to pursue perfection and wholeness and harmony and peace and love and joy and hope and all of those things that I offer, if you think you can achieve them on your own, let me give you a list of rules to follow so that you can try to do that. That's the Old Testament law. So you have a people who are set apart, supposed to be different from the world by their actions and their behavior, and to achieve this, the garden, right? Right? Chapter 1 and 2 of Genesis. We're supposed to achieve that by following the law. The problem is nobody could do it. After the law is given in Genesis, Exodus, you can read about it in Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. This whole chunk of the Bible here, let's see, Jesus comes right there. This whole chunk of the Bible here, which is the largest part of the Bible, is all about how the people of God, Abraham's people, Israel, that's, that's what their name is going to be, the people of God, how they cannot live up to the covenant. That's what this whole thing is about. They've been circumcised. They've been brought into the people of God. They've been given their, their rules and their laws to follow, but they can't follow it. They can't keep up their end of the bargain. God's going, I said I'd be your God. Now you're going to be my people, and the way you're going to be my people is you're going to follow these rules, and they can't keep up their end of the covenant. And so God doesn't have to keep up his end of the covenant. He could say, all right, well, if you're not going to be my people, then I won't be your God. Israel constantly runs away from him, constantly breaks his laws, constantly breaks his rules. They are unable to achieve that harmony and that hope and that peace and stuff that they thought that they could pursue on their own. They're unable to achieve it, and they continuously run away from God. And what we see constantly in the Scripture is God is faithful to continue to pursue them and chase them down, even in the midst of their rebellion and in the midst of the time that they are far away from God and not even thinking about Him and doing things that they know hurt His heart and the heart of others. For some in this room, that story may ring true for you as well. But the glorious God that we have is a God who will not relent. He comes after us. He pursues us. And he starts making promises. You don't, you don't have to turn there. I'm going to read a couple of different things. You can turn if you want to, but you don't have to. I'm in Jeremiah chapter 31. Okay, Jeremiah is a prophet. He hears things from God and tells the people. And, and God says to his people this, Behold, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. In the future, soon, coming, I'm going to make a new covenant. And it's not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I, brought, when I took them by the hand to bring them out of Egypt. My covenant, they broke, even though I was their husband, declares the Lord. It's not going to be like that one, he says. Verse 33 says this, For this is the covenant that I will make in the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The new covenant, the law, is not going to be on stone tablets held by uh, Charlton Heston um, on the on the mountain, right? No, the the new covenant is not going to be about external laws that you have to follow to try to earn the favor of God or try to try to try to achieve the garden. The new covenant, the law, is going to be within us but we're going to want to pursue the things of God. He says, no, one shall, no, no, one shall, no longer shall one teach his neighbor or each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. And here's why. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. So the new covenant I'm going to make with you is, I'm going to fulfill your end of the bargain as well. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going, to, I'm going to change your heart so that you don't long for the same things that you used to long for. I'm going to inject in you that righteousness and that holiness that you are longing for and that you're after uh, in, the, in the identity that you're pursuing and the peace that you want. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to squash that into you. I'm going to do that for you. The new covenant says you've proven that you can't fulfill your end of the deal. So I'm going to fulfill your end of the deal as well. 
Let me jump somewhere else. Luke chapter 22. Jesus has been born at this point. And he gathers around a table um, for the Passover meal. And he takes a cup. And, and he says, This cup, this is Luke chapter 22. I'm reading from verse 20. This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. You hear what he said? Jesus, Jesus comes, eats this meal with his disciples. And he says, in this cup is the new covenant, which is in my blood. The new covenant that, that Jeremiah talked about. This new covenant where God is going to write his laws in our hearts uh, and that, that he is going to change our bent away from him towards him. Where he's going to forgive our iniquity and remember our sins no more. Jesus is saying, that happens in me. And at the same time that he took that cup, he took some bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. In the sacrifice of Christ, we find the forgiveness of our sins of breaking the covenant with God. And through the life that is in His blood shed for us, we find a transformed heart, a new life, a forgiveness for all the things we've done in the past, the sin that we're committing right now, and the the sins we're going to commit in the future, that all is bound up in the price that Jesus paid on the cross. And then in his resurrection, after he was crucified on the cross, he he made atonement for our sins. He paid the penalty for our sins. And then he defeated the penalty by being resurrected three days later, coming back from the dead to offer us new life and a resurrected life in him. So the old self, the old person who is bound in sin and in shame is put to death with Christ and is born again into a new life in him. This is the new covenant, that through faith in Christ, when we say, yes, yes, I'm a sinner, I need to repent from that, and we believe. That's what the scripture says, repent and believe. To turn away from the things that are not of God, to turn towards Christ, to believe that he makes atonement for our sins, that he is the one that can transform our lives, that he is the one, going back to the garden again, that he is the one who truly and honestly should be in charge of our lives. And that opportunity for us to know God in a personal, relational way, for us to be a part of His covenant people, that opportunity is given to us through the death and resurrection of Christ. Okay? Now, the new covenant people of God, the old covenant was governed under the law of the Old Testament, right? And the physical mark of that covenant community was circumcision. Jesus says there's a new covenant in my blood. A new covenant that's not bound by the laws of the Old Testament, but is is bound by grace. By the forgiveness of Christ. So what what that means then, friends, it's not about you being a good person. Okay? The majority of people, if you ask them, do you think you're going to get into heaven after you die? Their answer is, if there's a heaven, yeah, I think I'll be there. Um, and, and usually that's because they'll go, you know, I mean, because if there's a bell curve um, on good people, I think I'm probably, I'm better than 50%, right? I mean, you can line up the criminals, and I'm not one of them, um, and, and Hitler counts twice or maybe three times, and so that kind of swings the things in my favor as well. I mean, that I'm, that I'm pretty certain I'm on the good person side of things. I mean, I know I do some things I shouldn't, but we all do. So yeah, yeah, I think I'd get into heaven. But, but you see, the Scripture doesn't talk about, the Bible doesn't talk about good people. It, it doesn't talk about good people and bad people. In fact, the Scripture says there's no good people. It talks about righteous and unrighteous. That's it. It doesn't talk about are you a good person or are you a bad person. It talks about are you righteous or are you unrighteous. Are you part of the covenant people of God or are you not? And the way you become a part of the covenant people of God is by believing in the death and resurrection of Christ. That He forgives you for all your sins. Every single one of your sins has been paid for. Even that one. Whatever whatever that one is for you. 
That one that you've carried with you. That one that still shames you. That one that still, when you close your eyes to go to sleep at night, you think about and you worry someday somebody will find out about what you have done and about the darkness that is in your heart. Even that one is forgiven. Even that shame is removed from you because of the grace of Jesus Christ. If you will repent and believe in Him, Through His death and resurrection, through faith in Him, your sins are forgiven and new life, transformed heart is offered to you. Now, Old Covenant, the physical sign was circumcision because we traced our lineage through, uh, I can trace my, my family history back to Abraham. The New Covenant people, we don't trace our lineage back to Abraham in the same way. We trace our lineage back to Christ. And so we are brought into the covenant people of God through the death and resurrection of Christ. And the physical sign that is given to us is baptism. Because if at the heart of being a part of the old covenant people was being physically related to Abraham, and so they marked the thing used to make more generations, what binds us together, what brings us into the new covenant people of Jesus Christ is being buried with him in his death and risen with him in his resurrection. This is the physical sign of the new covenant. Because at the heart of the new covenant is the death and resurrection of Christ and us sharing in that by the death of the sinful person that is inside of us and the raising to new life, the one who is forgiven in Jesus' name. That's what baptism is about. That's what happens here through faith in him. That the gospel is about forgiveness. And it's not just about an individual forgiveness. It's not just about you and your sins are forgiven, but rather that you become a part of a people. You become a part of the covenant people of God. Old covenant people, Israel. New covenant people of God, the church. The church. Church isn't just something we do on Sundays. It's not something we just show up and have some pageantry and eat you know, some juice and crackers um, and sing some songs and go home. The church is the people of God who are gathered to worship Him and know Him and serve Him and be changed by Him and experience Him. And so at the waters of baptism, when you come up out of these waters, the first thing you see are the people of the church looking at you. They're your people. They're your family. The one who, when you continue to screw up, even though you've been forgiven, even though you've been given a new heart, even though the Lord is working on you, you continue to be a sinner and you continue to mess up. These are the people that are going to love you. These are the people who are going to help you work through that. These are the people that are going to forgive you. These are the people who are going to help you learn. These are the people who are going to serve alongside of you. That's what the church is about. And at the, in the waters of baptism, we come up and we see the church greeting us, smiling, receiving us promising in the service to help raise us in Christ. The first thing you know when you come out of these waters is that you are not alone. God has not only forgiven you, He's given you a people to walk alongside of you. That's what happens here. That's what's happening in this tub. Now, when our folks come to be be baptized... They must, they must come with faith. And then you say, well, wait a second. Some of the people who are going to be baptized today, they're kids. How do you know that they have the right amount of faith? I mean, how do you, how do you know? What if they grow up and they didn't have the faith that they said they were going to, right? Um, and so this is, this is where it gets awkward for some people, right? Because you go, uh, I mean, maybe you can't baptize babies because if you baptize babies, they don't have a faith yet. Well, that's if you look at it strictly from an individual faith standpoint. We're talking about the covenant people of God. Our salvation is ours, not just mine, it's ours. And so just as, just as Israelite children were able to be circumcised on the eighth day, whether they had a say in it or not, so we can baptize our babies as well. Because when they come out of this water, the vows that have been made over them have been made over them in faith by the community. And that the community as a whole has vowed to raise them and to love them and help them live into it. Not all Israelite children who were circumcised on the eighth day were faithful Israelites. Not all babies who are baptized are going to grow up to be faithful Christians. They have to bring an actualization to that through their faith over the course of their life. 
But that doesn't keep them from the waters of baptism when the covenant people of God can come together with a shared communal faith to bring them to Jesus Christ. Now, the other question is, what about how much water, right? Can you sprinkle a baby or can you sprinkle an adult and does that work? Or do they have to be fully immersed? I would say this, really? <laughs> I mean, like, that's, that's my deep theological answer to this question. Honestly, I mean, we, we are talking about God becoming one of us in Jesus Christ, dying on a cross for the sins of the whole world, rising again out of death, calling us to participate as people of the covenant, and that entrance into that is baptism. And we want to go, but if you don't use enough water, if you just sprinkle it on their head, I don't think it works. Really? We're not casting spells here. This is not an incantation, right? Where, we're, where we have to somehow transform them through water. That's not what this is about. This is about God working in their hearts and in their lives. So yeah, look, immersion baptism is great um, because we can see that death and resurrection stuff that we're talking about. But if somebody's been sprinkled, they're okay too. They're okay. They're going to be all right in this. So what I want you to see is this. As we, as we start to move towards, towards our actual baptism stuff today, is this. I know that you're wrapped up in your own life. We, we all are because, because that's our natural bent, again, is to be turned inward on ourselves. But, but guys, there's something much bigger going on around us. God is active in this world and has been for thousands of years. Thousands of years, and he's still active today. And when we see, this is, a, this is, what, this is what some people call a thin space, right? Where, where the, the barrier between us and God gets really slim, and we know his presence so deeply. When in the waters of baptism, what, what we experience is a thin place. What, we, what, we, what happens here with us and with these folks who are in this, this pool and with us as a community who support them, this is a thin place. Where the, where the ancient work of God that is still ongoing busts into our lives for a minute. So I pray that you'll experience that today. I pray, I pray that you'll have a great joy. Like baptisms are so boring in a lot of places, right? I mean, they, they're like shoved in in the middle of a service. We've got to get this thing done quick and then get out of here. And we don't want to run the service too long, so let's just move this along. I mean, they're kind of, they're, they're sort of, they're, they're sort of on the sidelines of things. This is, this is at the heart of who we are as Christians. And so this is a great and joyous day and we should act like it. We should enjoy this time. This is a life-changing moment for these folks. And you have been invited through the power of the Holy Spirit to be here this day to support them in it. In fact, in our our worship service, in our liturgy that we're going to read together, there's a part where I ask them questions, but then I turn to all of you. And I ask the community, will you do all in your power to support these people in Christ? Now the answer that's going to be up on the screen is, we will. Um, if you're pr- going to promise to do that, then say it. And say it so they can hear you. Say it like you really mean it. Like, uh, yes, yes I will. I'll make that promise and that pledge in whatever way that I can. And however, uh, however my connection with them is, I promise that I'll help to raise this person in Christ, to, to build them up, to disciple them, to push them towards the Lord. I promise to do that. Yes, yeah, yes I will. If, you, if, that's not, if you're not going to do that, don't make me make a liar out of you. Don't say it. Okay? Just, I'm not going to call you out a promise. I'm not going to go, she didn't say it. Right? I'm not, I, pro, I promise I'm not going to do it. This is, this, is not, this is not just a ceremony for ceremony's sake. This is not just a play where I say my lines and you say your lines. We are experiencing the great move of God, and we are making a pledge through faith with our hearts to, to sponsor and support these children and adults who are giving their life to Christ in this way today. So if you're going to make that pledge, make it like you mean it. If you don't, then don't. But let's do it with integrity. This is a big moment. Are you excited? I am. All right. So let's do this thing. So.